Hello everyone, thank you for tuning to the Racket channel. In um, After the last video that was essentially, essentially a primer, and today we're going to start with our first example. Um, and because I'm somehow fractal addicted, um, you can also see this in my, um, in my overall tutorials. And I'm going to stick to this scheme for now and I decided to take an um, example of a very nice uh, fractal algorithm I want to show you and I'm going to explain on this example um, the essentials of racket programming. We're going to start with this right now. Um, first I'm going to explain you something as a little second primer for understanding the fractal algorithm a little about um, point translation. And that's what we're going to start with now. Okay, <clears throat> so what is point translation? This is something, this is a term coming from the um, mathematical world, uh, from the chaos theory and uh, the theory of fractals. Um, point translation means nothing more that you have a set of points Let's um, draw them like this. And these are fed as a parameter set to a function. That also can take a lot of different parameters. And the result is a new set of points. That means that the original set of points is translated into some other set of points. So points can change their position and they can also change their state. That means they can be set or unset. So, this is a very, very basic introduction <clears throat> what um, point translation means. Now let's think we have some kind of surface. This could be a window on our computer screen. So, this surface contains points starting in the upper left corner here going to the right corner and proceeding here again to the right corner and so on so on so on so this is nothing more than a set of points you can also um, make another view on this model and you can see all those points aligned in one big line starting from here let's say this is position zero this is this one and then a lot of points and ending in this position that is end. <clears throat> so, um, I came across the working of the point translation algorithm as a hint on in a very good ebook about fractal programming and uh, the author um, made some really cool um, examples uh, about how you can uh, make your own fractal algorithms um, with some very, very good hints. He said one way you could do a very interesting point translation is imagine you have a surface and you take one point, for example, this point here, as a starting point. And the algorithm works in a way that he takes this point and first decides if this point is set or unset. So let's say the point is set. That means it has a color like black or red or something like this, but it's not white, it's not the background color. So the algorithm makes two um, decisions. At first um, he takes um, the information if this point is set. If the point is set, then the algorithm unsets this point, that means it puts it to the background color. Uh, let's make it um, visible like this, this point is unset. and then move 10 positions further to the right and take this point as the next point um, to be uh, re-entered in the fractal algorithm. If the point was unset, then set this point and move 5 steps backwards and take this position as the next position for re-entering the fractal algorithm. Um, by Doing this very simple, um, the simple processing, you get um, really interesting and somehow weird pictures um, that are generated by 
this continuous setting and unsetting of points. Of course, this is a very simple algorithm, moving some steps forward, some steps backward, um, with a with constant, um, uh, well, about a constant distance, <coughs> is a, a very easy approach, but you could also use some more complicated mathematical um, functions for calculating the distance. For example, you could use sine or cosine functions that are depending on the position of the point inside this whole point array. <clears throat> and this is what I've done in my algorithm. And I'm going to show you now how it works. Okay, so I already started Dr. Racket. Uh, you should know um, in case you not already know it, uh, that Dr. Racket is the um, IDE, the development environment of uh, the Racket language, which, which is Scheme. And Scheme is coming from Lisp. These are functional language uh, with a lot of um, variants and dialects. And Racket is, uh, let's say, um, one family of dialects inside the Lisp world. At least this is my opinion. Okay, <clears throat> you can retrieve Docker Racket if you don't have it already on your computer. Here from um, drracket.org and here's a download section and I don't know why it switches here to the another home page um, I just wanted here to go to download and you can download Racket and there are distributions for Linux and uh, Unix, Windows and Mac OS. I think most of you guys will need the Windows version. Um, I for myself am sticking to Linux and for the Ubuntu users it's very easy because Dr. Racket is also in the Ubuntu repository. So it's uh, very easy to use the uh, software manager to install Dr. Racket on Linux Ubuntu. Okay, um, I will tell you how to operate this um, development environment, uh, let's say, on the fly. Uh, let's start with a very simple action, um, opening a file. You can see my menu here is in German, because my whole Linux installation is in German. So please translate it to English in your own brain. Um, opening is done by clicking on Open, and um, then you go to some uh, folder you have, and uh, I'm now going to load a program, in the, um, it's called structure.racket and that is opened. A more convenient way to open uh, several um, uh, programs in, in, in one development environment is to use the tabs uh, menu tool. You can say open tab and then you get a, a second tab here on the window and then you can load um, a second program or as much programs as you want. So let's load this point translation record. Okay, so now we have it. <coughs> and um, let's start with the most simple things here in the, um, in the program. This is a loading of um, Oberon. M uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm still have the Oberon flopping in my brain. Um, I mean um, the importing of um, Dr. Record libraries or modules. This is done by the require command. Uh, the first, the first line you can see here is always, um, let's say, committing. Um, it's the lang command. Um, by this command, you tell Dr. Record that you really want to use a record language because, as I told you, there are several dialects available for Dr. Records um, because it's also a teaching language. And um, by typing hash lang racket, you always tell Dr. Racket that you want to um, use the full racket language implementation. Okay, 
Then you have the require command. The require command is always used when you want to add additional functionality to um, the base functions of records uh, that are implemented as libraries. And we're using the graphics library and we're using the date library. Okay. The next thing is um, variables. We use variables um, in multiple ways as global and local variables. It's always good practice when you write a program in Racket that you define your global variables at the beginning in, in an own, let's say, section, the text section. And uh, variables are always um, specified by the define keyword. Define means that a new variable is declared and it's also initiated. So you can write the name of the variable for the declaration process and you also can apply an init value. So now we have here a variable named BP width. This is the width of the fractal window we're going to make and it's initiated to 300. And another thing, it's also good practice, um, at, at least that's my opinion, when you apply a leading and a trailing asterisk sign uh, on the name of your variable. This is, um, this is not committing, uh, this is coming from the Lisp world. In the Lisp you always make those variables more readable and distinguishable from local variables by applying these asterisk signs. And I think it's a good idea where you can do it like you want, it's not committing. Uh, I think it makes the code more readable, but it's up to you to do this or not. Okay, so we have some variables here um, defining the width of the window we want to make, the height of the window we want to make. We have a color set. And here you can see something looking, looking a little weird. That seems to look like a function that takes parameters, as I told you in my last video, um, telling you the very basics of Dr. Racket evaluation. Um, but this is a little different here. This is not a function in the in the in the deepest sense of racket. It's a structure definition, and the structure is something I can show you here in more detail. The structure can be defined in Dr. Racket by using the struct keyword after the open parenthesis, and then applying a name for the structure. This is structure test, and then you apply a list. Uh, enclosed in parentheses of um, variables you want to place into the structure. So I think that's this is looking um, pretty similar to um, the structure definition in C. Uh, this is a, a type um, a specification or a type definition here. And when you want to lose uh, use this type, you s um, declare it as a variable. You say define test. This is a variable name. And it's of type structure test. This is the type of the structure, and you initialize the structure with the variables one, two, and three. And you wanna, if you want to retrieve those variables out of the structure, um, you're using something that uh, Dr. Records provides. Um, this is uh, using the structure name, which is a structure test. It is in the name of the structure type. And um, adding a hyphen in the name of the variable you want to get. So structure test hyphen A means that the contents of A are extracted, which is 1, or uh, the contents of the variable B into the structure are extracted. This is 2, and so on and so on. When we start this, you can see how this works. Um, after evaluation, you can see we have those uh, variables 1, 2, and 3. These are the values we use for the initialization of the structure are now extracted and can be used for some other evaluation. So this is all about structures in the most simple way. So now let's get back to our code. Um, What we're now doing here is um, that um, we're using the structure, or the structure is uh, declared and specified in the graphics library, and is used to yes to specify a color. 
The color uh, is composited of the the parts of the red, green, and blue part, and these are identified here by a real number. The number one means you have a full color impact, and zero means you have uh, zero color impact. So. 111 one, one means that you have full colors of red, green, green and blue, so this gives white. Uh, so we specify one color here, this is uh, a little reddish for the point the point that has to be set, we name it color set, and the second color that is white is a background color. And then we have some other parameters here we gonna dive into a little later. And we have something that's called a start point, and the point also is a structure uh, in Racket and um, specified in this library and um, uh, the graphics library provides a macro that is uh, called make posen. The restructure name is posen but make posen is a macro that um, that uh, um, instantiates the structure so you can uh, apply it to a variable and it's initialized with uh, with two components, which are the x and the y coordinate of the of the um, of the point. Okay, but before uh, we dive deeper into this stuff, I want to show you how this works. So, if we press start, you see we have a window here, which is called fractal, and now I can control these this algorithm by pressing keys. When I press the spacebar you can see that this area is filled with weird patterns. I can stop it by again pressing the key bar. You can see this looks like, uh, for me, it resembles the, the ground of a desert with some weird city skyline in the background. But this is a matter of interpretation. And when I press spacebar again, this um, transforming process continues you can see that it goes through different stages and always changing um, the contents of the pictures. So now we have some kind of arcs here looking a little bit like like the tribunes in a stadium. Here you can see also some kind of arcs sometimes running from left to the right or um, sometimes the other way around. Now you can see this really looks like a tribune in a stadium now. Um, and all this depends on the parameterization of the um, point translation. Uh, I'm going to show you this a little later. So I can stop this now by pressing um, spacebar and when I press P, the key P, then you can see a picture is safe. So the contents of the window are saved as a, as a picture in PNG format. And when I press X, the X key, then the whole application is terminated. Okay, now I want to tell you how this works. I hope we can go through all those details very roughly in one video. Um, if it gets too long, I think I will split this explanation into two videos. But okay, let's see how far we can get. We start with the main code. All those other functions we are going to explain when they are invoked. So, uh, first we use open graphic. This is the command coming from the graphics library. So the graphics library is opened. And uh, I use the condition construct, you know, from my first lesson, the Dr. Racket Primer, to see if the graphics interface is really open. If it's really open, this command here returns true, or evaluates to true. And then we have a a keyword here named begin. Begin is always necessary when you um, when you sequence uh, sequence commands in Dr. Racket, because you know, as I told you, Dr. Racket is a functional language, so you have a lot of functions that uh, are calling each other forth and back, and uh, sequential command processing is not um, is not uh, the first cup of coffee for for Dr. Racket. Uh, this is uh, really different from other programming like for example uh, basic which is extremely sequential in, in programming process in uh, command processing uh, it's a little different so when you want to apply a really a list of commands that are um, 
they're called one by each other, you have to place this begin keyword to tell Dr. Racket that now a sequence counts. Okay, uh, the first um, line here is a is a command that uh, displays that the graphic clip was successfully opened. And then now you can see we're entering a local, um, let's say, text area. Dr. Racket uses something uh, that's called lexical scoping. That means that you can uh, realize between two parentheses uh, a chunk of source code um, where you can specify variables that are only used locally. And this is always initiated by um, an open parenthesis and let command or variances uh, or, or variance of a let command. There are some different subclasses available for let. And between these two parentheses here, uh, you can see we, I, uh, or I um, uh, specified some local parameters named wpwind and wppicked and these parameters are assigned the results of um, evaluation of two commands open viewport fractal wpwith and wpHate. I think you can imagine that this is generating the window you just saw because it has a name fractal with a specified width and height and uh, let's say the handle of this window is assigned to wpwind and WP pitch is something very similar um, because open pix map is um, not very far away from open viewport but it, it generates not a window it generates a, a background graphical data structure named pix map where you can store pixel data in the same way as in a window but it's not visible so you can do all your drawing actions in the background on the PIX map and when your drawing process has finished then you flip the switch and uh, by using of one command you can transfer all those contents of the PIX map structure to your window and this is what we are doing here. This ensures that um, uh, we will not display our fractal until all those drawing processes are completed. Okay, uh, then we use a command draw pixel also from the graphical library and with the handle of the background, let's say window, um, to place a point uh, with the coordinate start point. Uh, this was the structure I showed you here at the top of your document. Uh, this one here, this is a structure for a point. Um, with a specified color, so the point is set. Uh, when you take a closer look here, you can see something very interesting because normally, from what I told you in my primer lesson, you would expect a function name here because normally the convention is open parentheses, function name, parameters, close parentheses. But instead of a function name, you see these two parentheses here with the content draw pixel VP picked. What you can see is <coughs> some of the key features of Dr. Racket that you can apply functions that return functions because this is exact exactly what's happening here. Draw pixel is a function provided by the graphical library. It takes VP pitch um, as a parameter and it returns a function as a process of the evaluation of this command here a function that takes these parameters and sets a point. So you really have a function as a result of a function. It's a little bit weird um, to think about this stuff um, in the first time, but um, by the time you get used to it, it's a very powerful mechanism. So now we come to the loop. This is a loop that is doing all the calculations. Um, I showed you the structure of a loop in my last video, and you know that this loop has a name and it's working more or less like a function call. We have some parameters here. The p parameter is containing the actual point and it's um, obviously initialized with a start point. Then we have a second parameter named round. Round is, um, is counting the cycles 
that are done, the transformation cycles, until we display again the contents of the fractal. <coughs> and then we have a variable named status, and it's initialized to a symbol we call stopped. This is um, something like a little state machine I applied here because we have different uh, state here. We have a status stop, we have um, run, we have abort, and we have print. All those st uh, state are um, controlled by key presses, and therefore I use uh, as a as a first initialization for status the status stop. That means that uh, nothing is happening. <coughs> now um, we start by um, copying the contents of the background picture to the front picture. This is done by the um, command copy keyword coming from the graphics library. And then we have a condition construct. First we ask if status is stop. If status is stop, we re-enter the loop, as you can see here, loop, p, round, and something I'm going to explain to you in a few seconds. That means we are going back to the start of the loop with an unchanged point um, and an unchanged um, round parameter. That means uh, that the cycle count is not decremented and the point stays the same. So that means, in other words, that nothing is happening. And um, the status here is the result of a routine now, or of a function that is called key control, that takes um, the um, handle of the window, not of the background pix map, of the window, and the actual status. And we're going to dive into this routine now, and it is here. Um, why do we need this um, handle for the, for the window? and not for the background data structure. This is because uh, we are looking for key press events and key press events inside this um, graphic library are bound to the window you are using. So for this reason we have to use um, the, the handle for the, for the window which is we prewind. This is inserted as a parameter here. And then um, we we take a look at the status and if any key presses are occurring. This is done by read key press and uh, the parameter VP, so that means that this function is looking for key presses that are related to the viewport um, of our uh, window. And if a key press occurred well, now if no key press occurred, this is this line here, equates key press is false, then status is returned without any changes. So that means the status stays the same. And if this is not the case, <coughs> if we found any press keys, then we ask <coughs> at first if uh, the key is really a character. If this is not a character, um, we're returning also the unchanged status. This is just for safety reasons because there are also not only characters as a result of the key press event, there can also be symbols. For example, escape can also be a symbol and spacebar can be a symbol. To filter out these, these things, we, we use this line here. And then we look for the keys. For example, when the X key is um, recognized, we return the status abort, <laughs> that means terminate the application. If the, key, the press key was a, a P, then we ask if we already are in stop modus, because uh, this action is only done when the uh, algorithm has stopped, otherwise you would have no still picture on the window, and then we return the print status. And the character is white space, we ask if the status is run. If the status is run, we return stop. And otherwise, if the status is stop, we return run. And all other things that should not do occur, we also return the status unchanged. So this is what, what happens here. Okay. Um, the point translation is done in a function that is named translate point. And this is done here. 
in all cases when the um, the round parameter here has not come to an end, that means we are still in the uh, transformation counter loop and uh, uh, yes, let's 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 see this um, this case first. Um, translate point is invoked and it takes um, the handle of the background data structure and the actual point. And let's see what it does. This is this function here. <coughs> we also have uh, a conditional here on the function, and you see it's quite short because some functions are also outsourced to, to sub functions. I will show you in a few seconds. At first, we take a look if the the point is set or unset. This is done by the function get pixel. If we use get pixel uh, and the parameter of our background data structure and the point, um, we ask if it's zero. If it's zero, that means the point is unset. If this is the case, we set the point by using of draw pixel and the uh, color for the point which is set. Check borders is um, will be explained in a few seconds. In another case, when the point is already set, we unset it by setting its color to the color clear, which is the background color. So after this is done, um, we calling a function check borders, which also calls the function calculate new point. Now you can see very clear that um, Dr. Racket um, is using um, is, is, is using very hard those nested uh, function structures. That means functions that call other functions that uh, again call other functions. So that everything is split down into functions. The function that calculates a new point is this one here. Calculate new point. You can see this function here. It takes the point and it extracts in the way I showed you at the beginning of this video the x and the y coordinates of this point. Um, and what it does here is uh, more or less that um, it generates, um, let's say it's something of a help variable that um, specifies the position of the point between the start point, which is the upper left point in the window, and the end point, which is the lower right point. Um, so you can see it's something like uh, that all points are uh, arranged on one huge line, starting in the upper left and ending in the lower right. And so you can um, extract a position on this line. And this position is used um, for these two functions here. It's a sine and a cosine function. It takes <coughs> Uh, sorry, it takes the uh, the position, which is um, now specified in the parameter s, and some uh, and, a, and a constant value, which is specified in the global variable section, and multiplies that and divides it through the maximum amount of points, which is the multiplication of width and height of the window, and so you get something like a phase that you can use for the for the sign um, equation to get a result. This part here um, in the moment is not important. Uh, this is coming into action when you uh, specify some kind of algorithm that gets sticked. Um, this can happen, happen um, when you have a bad parameterization of your algorithm that it gets to some place where it can't, cannot escape anymore. For this you can use the continuous phase, this is something that is continuously incremented in every um, transformation run and this is independent of the point position, but for the moment we don't use this, so just um, just forget it and don't see it, please. Um, so we calculate by this way two, uh, two delta values we can apply for calculating the new point. At first um, and the counter, this is a global variable, is incremented 
and um, then we apply these um, two different um, delta values um, to the point calculation and um, we are doing it in a way that um, if the point one point was set and this is done or this is indicated by this parameter here dir if dir is 0 or 1 uh, specifies um, if the uh, previous point was set or unset and then we apply a delta 1 or a delta 2 so depending on the situation if the point was set or unset so this line here is not so important uh, this is uh, just generating the new um, position for the, uh, the, the new um, coordinates for the point. <coughs> okay, and um, as you can s could see here, uh, wait, yes, um, the calculate new point. Um, the result is fed into another function that is called check borders. Check borders is a function that does nothing than to check if the point, the new calculated point, runs out of the borders of the window. That that means it's, it's uh, going over the right border or going under the left border or going under the top or, or over the bottom of the window. In that case, uh, the coordinates of the points are wrapped around. That means, for example, when the point goes go through the right border of the window, then um, it reappears at the at the left border with an offset. That's a difference between the new calculated coordinate and the width of the window. <coughs> so this ensures that the point can't escape of the surface of the of the window. Yes, and uh, that's all that's essential to know about how this fractal works. And um, to give you some thankfulness for watching this video, I'm going to show you a small additional video I made um, with three different parameter sets of the fractal showing you some really interesting um, structures. And I hope you will enjoy it. Thank you very much and bye for now.